yourself. Give a warm welcome. Yay. Start that. Uh, how's the sound? Too loud? Okay. Okay. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you for coming to Passing the Baton, Succession Planning for FOSS Leadership. I am VM Brissor, but because we're all friends here, you can call me Vicky. Uh, I, here's my contact information. I encourage you to use it whenever you wish. The top is my Twitter handle. It is also at the bottom of every single slide in tiny little letters here. In the middle is my free node IRC, Nick, and the bottom is my email address. I am an open source policy and strategy freelancer. If your company needs help with open source compliance, contributions, community, other things that don't start with C, um, I'm the gal for you. I'm also an author and community moderator for opensource.com. Everybody always asks, will your slides be available? Yes. They are already up on Internet Archive, which frankly is where everyone should share all of their stuff. So here it is, Internet Archive. Um, there are two versions there, one with my speaker notes and one without. Now, succession planning can be a fairly complicated thing. Uh, I'm not going to pretend it's not. It, it can be difficult to do. I will be presenting general tips on how to approach this process, but not all of the recommendations will necessarily apply to your specific situation. Some of them will work better for larger projects, some for smaller projects. It really depends upon your project's needs. So take from this presentation what you need. Don't feel obligated to follow all of the recommendations to the letter. And finally, please save questions for the end. Hopefully, we will have a few minutes for that. But I have a lot to cover, so I'll just dive right in. So we have been sharing software for as long as there has been software. But free and open source as a recognizable movement only started 40 years ago. 40, 40. Let's take a quick look at some of our highlights. Some of you will be really excited to learn that it started with Emacs. Uh, Moon and Steel created Emacs. Stallman thought it was really cool, but he wanted something a little more uh, shareable. So he created his own Emacs that led to GNU, which also therefore led to the Free Software Foundation. That was in 1985. In 87, Larry Wall, who is one of the kindest people in free and open source software, he invented Perl. Do a little math and you'll see that Perl is celebrating its 30th birthday this year. So happy birthday, Perl. If you see any Perlers, Give them a hug, just send them PGF for a good start. In the 90s, things start to really pick up. Our own Python was invented in 1991, as many of you already know. Lots of exciting things happened. But importantly, the term open source itself was not coined or created until 1998. At the same, in the same year, the Open Source Initiative was created, and it is the warden of what it created that year, the open source definition. If something does not meet that definition, it is not open source software. 2000s, new century, new explosion of free and open source software and organizations. Things have escalated even past this. Free and open source software components, they've become the default selection for most companies. The VC, Mark Cuban, he's been quoted as saying software has eaten the world. And since he said that, just about every bloody tech journalist has followed up with an open source has eaten software. There's really no denying that free and open source software, the movements, they've changed the face of technology. And thank God, they are finally here to stay. That's wonderful. But we're starting to reach the scale and age where oral history does not cut it anymore. 40 years, and we still have our founders in our midst, but for how long? There are millions of projects. According to the 2016 GitHub Octaverse, there are 19.4 million public repositories in GitHub alone. That's not counting any of the other repository services. We rely on these every single day. Some of us could not do our jobs. I literally would not have a job without free and open source software. But 40 years on, we're really overdue to be thinking about how our free and open source software projects, how we will get by when our founders, our leaders, when they move on. These are not necessarily the Richard Stallmans and the benevolent dictators for life of the world. Every single project has people in important roles. Every project needs to consider a backup plan for when those people need to move on for one reason or another. And that brings us to succession planning and me taking a drink of water. 
So I have done a lot of research into succession planning. I am fairly business focused um, as well as being community focused. So I've done a lot on the business side, but also on the free and open source software side, including surveying and interviewing leaders and community members of open source projects and communities. So before we get going, I want to define succession planning so we're all on the same page. Here's the Wikipedia definition, which I won't read because we're all literate here. Um, now, this is a fairly standard definition for the literature on this subject. I'm not a really big fan of this definition, however, at least not in the context of free and open source, because it's fairly limiting. It implies that the leaders are the ones who need backup and successors. But in free and open source, what really is a leader? It can get fairly complicated. So what I prefer is to think of succession planning as a skills pipeline rather than a leadership pipeline. While the literature found, focuses on high level things like CEO and founder, this is free and open source. There are other important roles here, critical roles to the functioning of your project. Any project role which is measured by a bus factor, this is a role which can benefit from succession planning. And I would like to point out here that this is a skills pipeline and as skills, they are learned. Now, a moment ago, I used the term bus factor, and I used to assume everybody knew what this meant, and I was wrong. I make a mistake. Um, who here has heard of bus factor as a metric? Okay, not all of us. See, this is why one should never assume. So a bus factor for a project, it's a number. It's the number, it's equal to the number of people on that team member, a number of people on that team, who can be hit by a bus before the project is in a world of hurt, before it can pretty much, it will die if that many team members die. The worst bus factor is one. And a lot of free and open source software projects have a bus factor of one, where one person gets knocked out and the entire project is screwed. And that's because they haven't done succession planning. So when I talk about this, a lot of people sit in the audience and they go, 40 years, honey, please. We've always done it this way, why should we change now? Well, for starters, I need to point out that the phrase, we have always done it this way, is probably the most dangerous phrase in the English language. Um, so aside from that, there are some legitimate reasons why you should consider succession planning. The most obvious one is continuity. When somebody leaves, what happens to all that stuff they were doing? Does it just fall on the ground or does somebody pick it up and continue carrying it? Succession planning ensures tasks continue to be performed and no one is left hanging. If a person leaves a role without a replacement, it can lead to a lot of confusion. Oh, let's not spill water all over. That would be bad for AV. Um, so it can lead to a lot of confusion and delays and possible political woes for your project. And these political woes can be the most damaging things to your group. While delays are easily fixable, relatively speaking, hurt feelings are not. So creating a succession plan can help alleviate this very insecure and unstable time when somebody in a vital role has moved on. Everybody knows who's next in line and why. The thinking required for succession planning is also the same sort of thinking which leads to project longevity. The entire point of succession plan is you're taking the long view, right? So ensuring continuity and leadership and culture and productivity. This also helps assure that your project will continue. It will evolve as it should, but it will survive. This is a great one that a lot of people don't really consider, but if you have a succession plan, you know who's next in line to take over a critical role. They're training up for that position. They have just become a backup to the person currently in that critical role. That means those people, those leaders in critical roles are more free to take vacations. They're more free to take care of their ailing parents. They're more free to work on that crunch time at the office because they have someone who can get their back. It reduces burnout of project leaders and those in these critical roles. We talk a lot about mentoring in free and open source lately, specifically around coding. We have Outreachy, we have Google Summer of Code, amazing projects like that, which will help people get into free and open source software. But we can do this with succession plans as well, but not with coding. We can mentor people to become successors for these critical roles. This helps everyone. 
Those leaders will get successors, the project and the organization gets continuity, but the successors themselves get career development and experience. It can be very, very motivational for those people to come into a project and see a succession plan in action. They look at it and they're like, wow, OMG, there is a path to and a plan for leadership positions here. I can picture myself on that path. Maybe I want to stick around. Maybe you want to continue being a member of this project because not only do they have a path and they've thought this through, they seem to really have their shit together. And that's really motivating. Succession plans are also an amazing opportunity to bring in these new people and new ideas for leadership roles. Studies show time and time and time again, despite what Google memos might say, that leadership teams are more effective and the projects they lead are more innovative if they have diverse ideas and people on them. So a succession plan is an opportunity to open your door to those new ideas and approaches. This is where if I had a little soapbox, I'd stand on it. So um, I have a problem with meritocracy. People in many projects are very proud of their meritocracy and conceptually, yeah, I get it. It could be a good idea. But unfortunately, what passes in meritocracy typically translates towards into hostility towards new contributors. It contributes to echo chambers. If these people cannot express what merit is beyond, I know it when I'll see it, it's pretty obvious they actually haven't thought this through, have they? So a meritocracy without a mentoring program, without healthy governance structure, it's just an excuse to practice subjective discrimination. It's a way for bullies to hide behind their unexpressed biases. So if you cannot, you can't claim really to value merit. If you don't take the time to train people to earn that merit, or even tell them what merit is. So a well-executed succession plan helps with this. It's open, it's honest, it's documented. There are very, very few opportunities to hide behind weasel words like meritocracy. So as you can see, there are really a lot of great things which can come from having a succession plan. It's not a panacea. There will be problems, but there's a lot of worthwhile benefits here. But despite that, very, very few free and open source projects actually engage in succession planning. Well, why? Guess what? I asked. So from my research, I've found the following reasons why people don't do this. The most obvious one, they're just too busy. You know, they recognize it's a problem and that their project should do it, but they hadn't gotten around to it because there's always something more important to do. Now, I understand this. I really, really do. But personally, this is more of a problem with prioritization than with time management. It's very likely that these people just have not yet realized how bad it can be when one of those people move on from your project, when someone in a critical role needs to go do something else. They just haven't been bitten by this yet. Some people are just so busy and preoccupied that they haven't even thought about it. They haven't started to think, well, what would happen if Marietta left? They don't need to think of that. I'm sorry, Marietta, to call you out, because she's always there for them. She's always picking up the ball. She's always doing amazing work. They don't, and they're so busy, they don't have time to think, well, maybe we need to give her some breathing room, right? So they just don't think about it. More worrisome, some people don't want to think about it. Succession planning is often like estate planning. It's associated with negative feelings like loss, and it can make people address their own mortality. And people, some of them just aren't comfortable with this. Once in a while, you get a current leader, someone in a critical role who doesn't want to recognize that they might be replaceable. They don't want to consider that they might have to give up their power and influence someday. So this can really set their project up for long-term failure. This is a big problem. Um, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen, and it sh would be a major problem in your project if you had this. But very often, people just don't know where to start. They know it's a problem, they know it should happen, they are willing to carve out the time, they are willing to put in the effort, but they don't know where to start. Because, like I mentioned before, it is fairly complicated. Yay! I'm going to tell you, that's why I am here today. How do you even get started? Number one. <laughs> I'm going to throw a lot of really general ideas at you, and they are big ideas. These aren't just little discrete things you can cover in an afternoon. These are big, high-level ideas. Don't feel you have to do it all. 
Don't feel you have to do it immediately. It's okay. This is a process. Remember, the thing about succession planning is you're taking the long view. It's all right. It can and should take time. So don't worry if you don't feel like you're making progress on that. Don't worry about it. If you're working on it at all, you are making progress. Congratulations. Yay, go team. Woo. All right. So um, in the following slides, I'm going to give two sets of suggestions. Number one, for the people who are currently in those critical roles, the leaders of, uh, you can call them, of your project, what can you do? But the second set of suggestions are for everyone else on your project. People who might want to move into one of these critical roles, what could you do there? Well, let's start again with those current leaders. You're currently in a critical role in your project. What can you personally do to help cultivate people, to take on your position when you move on? Well, you can start by having a tasty drink of water. Hold on. Okay. Before you get started, this is not a solo project. You're in a free and open source software community. So remember, do all your work in the open. You don't have to take it to massive committee, but you should solicit feedback from the community. You do need to keep them posted on what is happening and why. Don't just pop them on this on them, like Athena bursting from the head of the leaders. Look, succession plan. No, that's not how this works. Step one, identify the critical roles in your project. People often ask me, well, Vicky, what are the critical roles? I'm going to go, I don't know. I'm not in your project. Only you can answer that. Only you and your project know what qualifies as critical for you. But most often, it's easy, easiest to start by looking at the people in your project. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Right? But then remember, a person doesn't equal a role. A single person can have multiple roles. So do keep that in mind. Now, once you have identified those roles, then take a look at how one should, what are the duties of those roles? Right? And be really honest with yourself. Like, make a list of, here's all the duties, the things that this role does. List number one. List number two. Here's all the things this role actually does. I will almost guarantee you the second list is going to be longer. So uh, be really open and honest about this, because otherwise you're going to hit a lot of snags that are going to make things painful later on. Now, if that role, the second list, is really long, break up that role into smaller bits. Right? Refactor it. Redistribute those smaller bits across multiple people. And if you do that, then what you've just done is taken one role, one bus factor, and increase that bus factor to three, for instance, if you break it up into three different roles and split it up across three different people. So you've improved your bus factor right there. It's awesome. But extra added bonus of refactoring makes it much less intimidating for people new to take on the role because it's smaller, it's more approachable. New role is easier to step into. As you're looking at these roles and you're refactoring them and rejiggering and really thinking about this for your project, consider limiting the tenure for the role. Don't ask me how long is right because, again, I'm not in your project. I won't have an answer for that. But uh, this, it gives the current role holder a light at the end of the tunnel. They don't feel trapped. They know that they have an option to re-up in 6, 12, 18, 24 months, or they can walk away and regain their life. So that's really great. But what this also does is it gives you a body of people who have already done this role. Every six months, every 18 months, however long, you turn over to a new person. And that's great because it means the person who is currently in that role now has a bunch of folks who know how to do it. So if they have an emergency, they've got someone to support them and back them up, and they don't have to feel bad about walking away from the project to take care of a sick kid. Now, you've identified the roles, you've refactored the roles. Now most of the work comes in knowledge transfer. Um, this is probably going to be an ongoing process. It should be an ongoing process, but undoubtedly you're going to need one great big brain dump up front. Just going to be necessary. Um, so what sort of knowledge should you consider gathering? So you have all those duties and all those roles. They don't occur in a vacuum. How does one even perform them? Now, some of these may be self-evident, but I don't care. Write it all down. 
Your perspective is different than somebody coming in new. So what's self-evident to you is not going to be self-evident to someone else. Please be very explicit. Transfer all of the knowledge about these processes and procedures. Does your project have Fastly? Does it use Travis, Twitter? Um, who runs your GitHub organization? What are the resources which help your project continue? So these are some of the things you should consider gathering and keeping documented somewhere. Also, resources are not necessarily technological. Do you have meetups? Who are the people who help you coordinate those meetups at companies? Who helps you with sponsorship? Right. These are also resources which you need to track because often these are personal relationships between somebody on your project and somebody out in the real world. Um, so when the person on your project goes away, you lose those relationships and that's kind of a problem. Credentials, to all of those resources I mentioned. No one person should ever, ever, ever have credentials for these services in your project, ever, full stop. Um, because when they go away, they take the keys to the kingdom and nobody else has copies. And then suddenly you can't update the website and what are you going to do? You're screwed, right? Um, I've also unfortunately seen this used for evil. People who are the only ones with the keys to the kingdom lock others out. People with the, who are the only ones with the keys to the kingdom embezzle funds. So, as you are looking at all these resources, this is your time to do a little cleanup and make sure they don't go to individual and personal accounts. They should go to role email addresses for your project, say admin at myproject.org, um, and then that role email address should be on the back end sending to multiple people. So you have oversight. And if you get a support ticket in from, say, uh, GitHub saying, we've got to change something on your organization, if that one person doesn't check their email, you've got multiple people who can back it up. And your project history. If you've been around for any amount of time, you have history for your project. Try to gather that for future generations. This provides the context which can help them make the best decision in the operations of their duties. Now you're gathering lots and lots of stuff. This is not a complete list, obviously, but once you gather it, Crying out loud, write it down, please. I don't care where, I don't care how. If you saw this session before this, it was really helpful for this. So hopefully you can watch that video, but write it down, right? Capture it for posterity. This is a talk on succession planning. If you don't write it down, you're not thinking of the future generations. But I'm here to tell you, no one's gonna read it. Um, just full disclosure, no one's gonna read your docs, and that's because they're gonna be really long and really complicated and really involved, and who has time for that shit? No one. Um, so put a TLDR at the top. This document covers these things and here's the highlights of what you need to do um, to just sort of remind people if they already know and to give them guidance if they don't know whether they need to read that huge long documentation. So uh, just think of it like an abstract for a research paper. That will make your documentation much more accessible for everyone. Now these are some of the things that current leaders should consider and obviously it's just a starting point. Right? There is already a ton of stuff to get into here, and we can get into advanced session planning, succession planning later. But I want to talk to the people who aren't currently in critical roles. What can you do here? If you're interested in contributing at a higher level in your project, how can you help? There's so much you can do. We really need you here. For starters, look around. Where can you help in these critical roles? Are there opportunities for you to learn more about the leadership and the operations? Ask to chip in. Volunteer for those small, possibly annoying, but I guarantee absolutely vital tasks that no one else wants to do. Because volunteering for the grunt work is a really great way to be an apprentice and get into a leadership position. Another way to do that is to shadow somebody in one of these critical roles. Not only does this allow you to see how the role is performed, the process and the procedure, which you can then take notes on, and write up, which is one of those grunt things that nobody wants to do. Look at all the benefits here. Um, but it allows you to see what's actually involved with the role so you can see whether you want it. And then ask. Ask, ask, ask. Those of us who mentor, we want to mentor, we love mentoring, but sometimes we're so busy we don't know it's necessary, so ask us. Believe me, we will be grateful to you for it. 
Um, if you're seeing somebody do a critical duty, a critical role, ask if they can teach you. If you do one of these tasks, ask for feedback. Ask for tasks you might perform. Just ask. It doesn't take much, and we are so grateful for it. It is one of the best ways to contribute. And then as you go to your meetups, as you come to a conference like this, listen to your project elders in a sort of metaphorical campfire. Sit around the campfire with them and listen to them spin yarns of the good old days, right? For extra points, write that down. Write down the history, document it, and put it in your wiki or what have you. Document the, the inside jokes. And that will help the new people coming in immensely, much more than you can possibly imagine. Now, when I first started doing this talk, my intention was to give examples of projects doing it wrong. And uh, it, very rapidly, I came up with two reasons why this was a bad idea. Number one, I don't name and shame. Don't know what I was even thinking. I was going to give examples of people doing it wrong. That's a terrible idea. I'm management, you don't do that in public. Um, but number two, in all of my research and, and all of my interviews, I discovered I just don't have to do this. Everyone has seen this in action. So you don't need anti-patterns. You need patterns. You need examples of people doing it properly. I have two projects for you. Only two, which means this is not an exhaustive list. Number one, exorcism.io. If you don't know of exorcism, I highly recommend it. It's not only a great service, it is an amazing open source project to contribute to. They will do everything possible to help you land your first patch. Um, so it allows you to complete exercises, to gain fluency in programming languages. And it has over 60 language tracks. Over 35 of them are active. And last year sometime, they looked at their language tracks to check the health of their maintainers. And what they found horrified them. The bus factors were sometimes below one. I mean, it was really bad. So they decided, we need to do something about this. And they have actively gone out of their way to try and get at least three maintainers for every single active language track. And it's still a work in progress, because again, these things take time. But they're making progress, and it's really great. And it allows their maintainers breathing room. And it reduces stress and burnout. And Vox Populi is my second example. Because it's an entire project, the only thing it does is succession planning. That's all it does, is make sure that projects continue to live. It is an umbrella organization where all of the members of it take co-ownership of puppet modules, which would otherwise be orphaned, but are still very active. So they have over 120 repository of Puppet modules, which the entire Vox Popoli uh, community maintains. It takes a village to maintain Puppet modules. And they do that. And it's really, they're doing a great job here. Um, I love them. So that's all the content I have for you. I want to have a couple uh, minutes for questions. Here's pictures. There's almost none there. And here are the slides again. Um, so are there any questions, but not comments disguised as questions? Anyone? Anyone? Oh, we are microphone free. Is it working? I don't know. Oh, it uh, works now. Yes, it is. How big does a project need to be before you can do succession planning? Clearly, you need more than one person. Uh, well, that depends, actually. Um, how, long, how large does it have to be to do succession planning? I don't have to repeat questions because he's got a microphone, but best practice, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, if it's a project which has a lot of users and one maintainer, that's a problem. <laughs> uh, I used to work with Donald Stuffed. And we all know Donald from uh, PyPI. For a long time, he was flying pretty solo there. Right? I'm thinking that one needed a succession plan pretty early on. He's got a lot more coverage now, which is amazing. And if you ever get the chance to meet him, he's a great human being. Um, but yeah, it depends on who's going to be hurt. If you don't, you know, it could be you just don't bloody well care. And you can walk. That's fine. That's up to you, right? But one person is still fine. Yes, sir, we've got another one in the back. So you talked a lot about succession planning with the aim of having somebody take over the project. 
Um, you didn't talk at all about how um, succession planning might mean planning the project gets turned down or replaced by another project. Do you have any thoughts about like succession planning by making yourself obsolete, I guess? Uh, so that is more of an end of life sort of succession planning, which is a completely different sort of talk. Um, and my friend Gareth Greenaway has a talk that's a lot like that. You can look it up. He's an amazing human being, used to run a SoCal Linux Expo for about 14 years. Um, great guy. So uh, he has a talk that's very much along those lines. Um, I only had half an hour, so what are you going to do? I think we might. Are we out of time, dear? Are we good? So. I think so. I think we're out of time. According to my timer, we are out of time. And plus lunch. What are you doing talking to me? Go, um, people. Before we oh, go, oh. Uh, can we just give a round of applause to Vicky? Oh. Thank you.